I'm eight years old. My parents take me to see the movie Some Like It Hot, starring Marilyn Monroe. It's a fancy theater with plush red seats. We're in the very front row of the balcony, high over the orchestra. A thick, shiny brass railing protects us from falling onto the people seated below. Marilyn is singing, I'm through with love, I'll never fall again. And as she breathes in deeply through her pouted lips to enunciate her words, I can see the details of her full breasts through her tight-fitting, completely sheer gown. I'm standing up, gripping the bar, leaning all the way over the top as far as I can, trying to climb into the movie to immerse myself between Marilyn Monroe's breasts. <laughs> I hear my mother calling to my father, psst, psst, Sid, Sid, look at Judy. What's going on with Judy? I'm 11 years old and I'm in trouble, mainly because I'm a lezzy, at least that's what I think I am. I've been in love with Judy in summer camp ever since I can remember and I know I'm not supposed to be. I've never met or seen a lezzy but I know it's a word that defines what I want as something nasty and bad, something that should not exist. It's 1962 in suburban New Jersey. There are no lezzies on TV and books or movies, except when the children's hour comes out on late night TV. <laughs> I watch as Shirley MacLaine confesses her secret love for Audrey Hepburn and then hangs herself. Audrey cautiously opens the door to see the ominous shadow of Shirley's body swinging back and forth, back and forth, as she hangs limp from a noose. That's the only solution, it seems. I write about my feelings in poetry. Why do I deserve this fate of hard, dark wall and iron gate? These aren't feelings that anyone I know talk about, and they aren't feelings I would ever admit. At 14, I'm in love with Elaine, one of my best friends. I want to throw her a wonderful birthday party. At first, my parents say okay, and then after I have everything planned, change their minds and say no. Devastated, I go into the kitchen and grab the black-handled dagger out of the drawer. I run to the basement where I had planned to throw Elaine's party. I fall on my knees, sobbing. I try as hard as I can to stab myself in the gut, but... I can't make myself do it. Every time I'm outside, I look up at the night sky and wish upon a star. Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. Wish I may, wish I might have this wish I wish tonight. I wish I was no longer a lesbian. I'm 15 and Mrs. Brooke is so beautiful. I am crazy in love with her. She has fair, delicately freckled skin, blue eyes, a full mouth, and a sweet disposition. And she's a really good high school teacher, too. I stand in front of her desk one day, gazing down upon her delicate, sparkling strands of wheat golden hair. I am so taken by her beauty. As her baby blues turn up to look at me, brazenly I blurt out, what does your husband have that I don't? <laughs> Mrs. Brooke looks at me like I have two heads. He's my husband. The school sends me to a social worker, an older woman, around my mother's age, who starts asking questions like general stuff. How's school going? She's acting stiff, nervous, uncomfortable, and I can feel her leading up to something. What do you want to do? Do to other girls, she asks, like her mouth is holding back vomit. It's the sexual part she wants to know about. I don't remember my answer. All I remember is the terrible feeling that everything about me is wrong and bad. At 15, I'm sexually assertive and simultaneously suicidal. I can't stand the pain of not having sex with a girl and not being loved. It just hurts too much. At 16, I fall in love with Peter. He's handsome, tough, with knife scars from fights, but he treats me great. <laughs> even, though, even though Peter is so sweet and I am in love with him, I have to be with a girl. She's a friend and I'm not in love with her, no matter. I leave Peter for Maddie. One day, I buy Maddie a new bra. 
Nothing fancy, not romantic, just a plain white bra, because she needs one, and I've got the money. Her sister finds the bra, shows it to her father, and he goes ballistic. He storms into my father's butcher shop and in front of all of the customers demands that I stay away from his daughter or he will put me in a house of detention. I am terrified because I know that man means business. So I lie. I don't know what he's talking about. My parents send me to a psychiatrist who tells me I can beat this. I had a boyfriend and I've had other boyfriends, which proves I like boys, and if I just try hard enough, I can stop wanting girls. I have a dream about riding a big stallion that rears up on his hind legs, but I manage to stay in the saddle and retain control. The psychiatrist tells me that the dream means I can conquer my urges towards girls. I see the psychiatrist once a week on Wednesdays, right after school. Each week he convinces me that I can go straight. On Thursday and Friday, I feel strong, and I stay away from Maddie, but then I can't stand it. Late Saturday night, Maddie and I get in my car and go to our usual spot, where no one will ever find us, right behind the police station. <laughs> this goes on until I leave for college. I'm at my locker getting dressed on the first day of freshman gym class. I turn around, and there she is, beautiful, long dark hair, dark soulful eyes, lovely skin, smiling. We become immediate friends. I follow Lori to her dorm room, and inside there's a big sign hanging from the ceiling with one word in large black letters, guilty. A shiver runs up my spine. I need to touch, be held. I need a girl to speak to me softly, to look deeply into my eyes, someone to kiss. I pursue Lori. We fall in love. Lori is very deep and moody, but also lots of fun. We're both passionate, and being secretive makes it all the more exciting. We must make love as quietly as possible because we are doing it on the top bunk of my bed right above my college roommate. I have no idea how we think we can get away with this. Maybe it's like being behind the police station, so obvious no one will even think to look. I have lots of other friends in the dorm, too. Everyone knows me. As I walk down the hallway, they greet me with a wave and a friendly, hey. Well, one day I'm walking down the hallway in the dorm, and a girl I know walks towards me and then turns her head away. And then another and another. Whenever I get on the elevator, all the other girls get off. Lori says the same things are happening to her. We do some research and find out that the progressive Antioch College in Ohio has a tiny sister school in Baltimore not far away. We visit small classes, interesting mix of students. Students have a big say in what happens at the school, and there are no grades. Yes! So we go to Antioch. On one of the first days of class, we're in a big group therapy session, a circle of about 50 students. I'm anxious. The leader stands in the middle of the circle, a tall, commanding black man with a booming voice. What if he calls on me? What am I supposed to say? I know why I'm here, but I can't say that out loud. He turns on his heels and points directly at me. Why are you here? because I'm attracted to girls. I barely get the words out of my mouth. I have my head down because I can't look at anyone. I really want to be totally invisible. I hear a chorus of female voices from different parts of the circle calling out matter-of-factly, I am too, me too, well so am I. I have never heard anything like this before in my entire life, out loud, in front of a whole group of other people. That moment, those women's voices, those were the voices of the first community of people to treat me and my lover like any other couple. Just me and Lori, like, like any other couple, like, like people, like 
human beings.